We have the concept of reading from the Torah. We have the Holy Scroll of the Torah. And obviously, when we need to read from the Torah, we take it from the Aaron Kodesh, from the Ark, and we read it. The issue here is sometimes we need to read a text, a biblical text, and we do not have the Torah at the front of us. When exactly we allow to say thing by heart and when not? Let's trace some examples. Amen. Friday night, we know that we recite Kiddush, the sanctification of Shabbat, in a synagogue, as well as at our homes. So when the Shamash, Chazan, Rabbi, whoever does those Kiddush, those prayer, the question is, can he recite by heart? Does he need to have the Sidur? Or you may even say that since he's a biblical text, he should use the original text. We obviously know that the Chazan used the prayer book, the Sidur. But what exactly that came to be? There is a concept which appear in several times in the Talmud, saying in Hebrew, Dvarim Shebichtav, things that was, that was in writing, I atar rashai leomram al you cannot say it just by heart. So here we are on page 28, the Mishnah tells us, Parasha gdola korim ota b'shnayim b'shacharit, u'musaf u'mincha korim al piyem. So here we said, if you remember yesterday, that it was an era of ritual offering, which is they used to take a sacrificial offering and brought them. And it was a statement we said yesterday that without those offering in our homiletical uh, language, the world not created without that. And in our days, we have the substitute of our lip service with our prayer and our quotation that is substitute for those offering. So now we ask how far we go with that, especially when you have those sex segment in the Bible that you can say by heart. Shema is a good example. People in general know it. So they said, What exactly the meaning in the Mishnah? בשחרית ובמוסף קוראים אותה בספר ובמנחה קוראים אותה בעל פה כי קוראים את שמה או דיל מה הכי קטן בשחרית קוראים אותה בספר ובמנחה קוראים אותה בעל פה קוראים אותה בעל פה קוראים את שמה. Here we try to differentiate between different prayer and the question is where you put the comma and where you put the period. We have a list of different prayer morning prayer, afternoon prayer, additional prayer and we ask here how we treat it do we say that in the morning, in, in the additional prayer, we need to read directly from the Sefer Torah, the Torah scroll, and in the afternoon we can say it by heart, the same as we recite the Shema prayer? Or the Mishnah meant the first part you need the book, the morning prayer, and additional and afternoon prayer, you can do it by heart, the same as you read the Shema. Now we elaborate in that dilemma. Tashma. The Tanya b'shacharit u'musaf nichnasim levet ha-kneset v'korim k'dayr shikorim k'ol ha-shana. So yesterday we explained that it was a different watch. Remember, we said that it was divided, it was the uh, people who are responsible for other meaning. We explained yesterday that each and every one needs to bring the offering. And part of the ritual is, um, is the idea that a person needs to stand next to his offering, place his hand, confesses, etc. That's part of the ritual. Since that cannot take place in the global matter, which is um, a building that contains X amount of people who can come in certain times, therefore it was a designated people that represents everyone else, and they take turn. So those people called the watch. Remember yesterday and day before yesterday? So therefore we said during the morning the additional prayer, 
those people use a book when they enter the synagogue and read it the same way as they read the scroll during all year around. Ubemincha in the afternoon prayer, Yachid Koreota Alpe. Here we try to differentiate between a prayer by individual as a prayer by the communal together. So in an afternoon prayer, one individual can say it by heart and he fulfill that obligation not just for himself, for others. You remember we discussed many times that there are some circumstances, especially with the erudite people who are more familiar with the text versus people who are not so familiar. We have one that recites something and exempt the other people who will listen to one who recited it. Okay, so Amara Biyosi, Biyosi challenged that statement and he said, <coughs> Here we have, which we call in Ivrit, Yesodot Bahalacha, very important foundation in several halachot. The question that Biyosi asks here, is that okay for individual to recite something that it's original written in the Torah scroll and he's recited in public without having the scroll at the front of him and by doing so others who listen can fulfill the mitzvah the obligation of hearing the, pre the, the text there are several Gemarot, for example, the Gemara in Tractate Gitin, page 60, the Gemara in, in Tractate Tmura, page 14. Those uh, Gemarot, those texts, have a long discussion over that. When and where and how individual can recite text by heart without having the text at the front of him. A um, good example for that, I think, is during the World War II. As we all know, our people were in camp, our people in different um, um, uh, places, and for sure in many of those, those scrolls or those books were unavailable. So it was at that time a great scholars and others who were able to, to read, quote unquote, meaning by heart, recite those texts. But those are circumstances, by all means, that a person do, does not have other choices. The question is, if there is an option or opportunity to use scroll, when you said to individual, you do not have to. So, if you go to the next step, um, um, you can ask that question about the Kiddush. Remember at the introduction we said that um, on Friday night we uh, take the, the wine or grape juice and we say those prayer and we quote Vaihulu. Vaihulu is a text in the book of Genesis. I saw in the modern days, uh, people in Israel, I saw it in particular, they have napkins that contain Vaihulu without name of Hashem, just to contain the, the paragraph mm -hmm. from the from the uh, Torah, but um, the, the, the discussion is in the code in uh, Shulchan Aruch and the Magen Avraham, which is the well-known Ashkenazic um, uh, authority, Posek, he rules on chapter 49 in the code that um, we should be astringent in that manner, which means um, individual needs to use the text when he reads it. The same, the Vilna Gaon, um, in the 18th century, uh, also said the same, the same thing. Now, we have to ask ourselves the next question. What do you mean by that? Do you require a Sidur, a prayer book? Do you require Chumash, right? Or you require Sefer Torah itself? What exactly you meant by that? So, if you go by the discussion in the code in chapter 49 there is a long one over that um, basically the, there is a school of thought Chochmat Shlomo wrote it the pre Megadim have it that they said that Parashat Bereshit the book of Genesis 
It's something that people are very familiar. So therefore, he brings a notion that maybe we should treat it differently. But in very general, there is a notion among most of the rabbis that when it's come to a text that um, it's not totally known to people, it's preferable, it's advisable at the first that you use the text. For example, if it's a Kiddush, you use the prayer book. But... I've got a challah cover that has a Kiddush on it. Challah cover has a Kiddush on <laughs> it. Beautiful. Yes, there is a, a school of thought like that, that they should have it. Yet, how about the Book of Psalms? We have Sefer Tehillim, the Book of Psalms, that people pray and use worldwide. So there is a Rispanta, Teshuvot Chavot Yair, it's a book, um, um, that uh, it's a well-known book in Halachic world. He holds that since the book of Psalms, it's a book of supplications, therefore, if a person does not have the book in front of him, he can still recite those prayers by heart. And again, uh, he holds that that's in in order to create a mercy and compassion from God so a person can close his eyes and make those prayers even without the book itself. So again, what we understand so far, it's advisable and wishable and, and in some manners even required to use book. Yet, there are some circumstances that we are lenient and said it's okay not to use the book. So back to our point here. So, the, the idea is, Tosfot Yeshenim, and Tractate Yoma, page 70, explains that the same way as we recite the Shema prayer, the same way um, a person can do it uh, um, in that, in that um, uh, manner. But meaning what we derive from that, that doing Mincha, doing afternoon prayer, a person can do it Be'alpe, by heart. Again and again and again, soon you see in a practical halachot, we are ruling, especially we, meaning the Ashkenazim, that we should use the book. Okay, the Mishnah said, Kol sheyesh bo halel, ein bo ma'amad. So, we have here uh, two entities. One is a prayer for thanksgiving, it's called the halel, and we explained day before yesterday that we have different halel and um, different prayer and different contextual meaning how large, how, how long. But when we have those additional prayer for the Ma'amad, so when you have the two, you do not combine the two. My fresh benzeleze. What's the difference between the prayer at the quote-unquote closing the gate prayer, the last prayer, Ne'ila, versus the Ma'amad, the prayer of the watchers on Mincha? Why the offering, the wood offering, if you remember we talked that they brought the wood, um, uh, the altar, so that part of the ritual they did it uh, during the Ne'ila, the closing the gate, and not the Mincha. So Rashi here um, have his view, but I would like to show with you for just a moment the Rabbeinu Gershom. Rabbeinu Gershom said here, Halalu divrei Torah ve'alalu divrei Sofrim. So he said, what is it? Aval korban etzim shen divrei Sofrim, chizuk t'asul chizuk shafir minilas enu samuch bo. So in other words, the, the offering of the wood is, is um, override regardless to the afternoon, the mincha prayer or the ilah prayer, and the same way as Rabbeinu Hanan Elhol. Rashi tells us that Halalu divrei Torah, the mincha, the afternoon prayer, is biblical. What does that mean, biblical? So we have a text in the book of Bereshit, book of Genesis, chapter 24, that said that Isaac, vayetze Yitzchak lasuach basadeh, that Isaac went to, to a field to pray. So Rashi said that that's a remez, its implication for the, for the, um, from the Torah to that way, um, the halalu divrei sofrim, and and therefore 
The other is it's the it's rabbinic. So the idea is that ikar tefillah, the mincha, the essence, um, uh, have some direct implication from the text. But you see how sensitive it is, how similar it is from one to another. Then the Mishnah tells us that Zman astei kohanim ve'am tisha. So Rashi tells us, if you remember when we studied the Mishnah on page 26, that it was the time that people volunteered to bring the wood, wood for the ritual on the uh, altar, for the hitting, um, the offering. So it was not a manner, Rashi tells us in the Mishnah, of daily basis. It was a time of the first day of the month of Nisan, which considering in some manners the beginning of the year, the era before Passover. So people volunteer to bring that wood for the altar, and that was sufficient until 20 day of the month of Tammuz, which is Nisan, Iyar, Sivan, and almost all Tammuz. Almost four months of uh, supply of wood that, that was good, and continue on with others. So nine times a year, the Kohanim, the priests and people volunteer to bring those wood to the temple and they bring a special offering on that day. What does that mean? The Mishnah gives us a list of those good-hearted families that did it. But since it was a need, um, not everyone, and it's expense, not everyone was ready to do it. So it was a certain time that those people did it and we recognized it, recognized it at that time and recognized that in the future as well. So soon you see a fascinating lesson from this Gemara. Tanu Rabbanan. Lama utzrichu lomar zman atzei kohanim vehaam. Why we need to say it was a certain nine periods a year that we recognize those people that brought the, and, and we have the exact dates. Amru kshe'alu b'nei agola lo matzu etzlim balishka. Listen carefully. We have the first temple, 410 years. And then the Babylonian king, the Buchadnezzar, forced us out of our land. We scattered, mainly in Babylon. Then our people went back 70 years later and built the second temple, which was a cheap, wood, simple building, until about 200 years later, when Herod came in and renovated and made the building a fancy building. So at the era when they, it was a, a movement lead, led by Ezra and Nehemiah that moved from Babylon to Israel, was a tremendous poverty, meaning people cannot afford anything. They are just made aliyah and they want to be part of the building. And the description of the book of Ezra is, one hand I am holding a sphere against the Samaritans, and on the other hand I am building the, uh, the new temple. So during that time, lo matzu et simbalishka, they tried to find some wood in order to hit the altar and bring the offering. And it wasn't available. And the way that we understand that wood was expensive. We all knew that, uh, that it's all a matter of supply and demand. But um, when you're dealing a large amount of, of, of offering on a daily basis, um, you have a great need for um, donation. So it was a list of relatively few families that the Mishnah referred to us, and yesterday we read those names, that voluntarily um, brought those offerings and we divided them to nine different periods a year that, that we used the offering, the brought. Those people out of great love, they brought the, the, this donation. So the leaders, they call them the prophets, the leaders of that generation, 
decided that it's an act of great appreciation, meaning even years later, the economical situation in the temple were better, yet those families and their descendants will be recognized even the chamber of the wood is filled of wood since their parents, grandparents, etc., etc., volunteered to bring that, it should recognize in a specific days all, uh, each and every year. Okay? So they said, Shene'emar, they said in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah, as we explained, that he was an administrator that joined forces with Ezra, the scribe, with leading the poor people, the the people who came from Babylon to build the second temple. They said in Nehemiah, book of Nehemiah, chapter 10, Ve'agoralot du palnu al kurban ha'etzim. We took a lottery. Ve'akwanim ve'alviim ve'am le'avi le'vet Eloheinu le'vet Avotenu le'itim le'zumanim shana v'shana le'va'erev mitbach Hashem Eloheinu k'ketu b'Torah. So in that sense, this was a Yom Tov, a special festive day festive days that applies to nine different times a year to those individual descendants of those families. So I would like to share with you a short story about Rabbi Tzchak El Khanan. Rabbi Tzchak El Khanan in the Torah world it's uh, one of the super giant scholars that live in a past generation. We are back in Europe at the time, um, at the early time. So we're speaking about 1900s in, uh, in Europe. It was uh, one of those small shtetl, a small vi- village. And in Beit Midrash, in the place of study, it was an extremely poor young man. His name is Yitzchak El Khanan. That was his name. And in the Beit Midrash, the heating system was not the best. And one of the students noticed that his uh, shoes are all torn and he's sitting there and he's freezing and he's in a Beit Midrash for so many hours. So he went to one of the rich people in the village and he said to him, this young man needs shoes. He sits and study Torah all day and he cannot afford. Can you buy for him a pair of shoes? The rich man said, let him go to work. Let him not study all day, let him go to work. So the story goes that Rabbi Yitzchak El Khanan turned very sick. All this, um, we call it in the modern days, a, um, you know, flu, sinusitis, mm-hmm. and all the other diseases. And they said for about a month, until someone yes. get him a gift of a pair of shoes, he was in bed sick. Many years passed by, decades, right? And Rabbi Tzchak El Khanan turned to be the luminary giant um, in the Jewish world, the, 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 the um, vanguard of Torah scholarship. So one time he traveled in Europe and he reached that small village. So imagine he was the guest of honor so many years later, with the horses and wagons and uh, big, big, uh, you know, like you have the, these big VIPs, they have many, many people around them, right? And nowadays you have bodyguards and you have all kinds of people around those VIPs. So you get to that village and the rich people wanted, to, um, several of the rich people wanted to have him um, stay in their home, hotel, etc. He insisted that he wants to be in the shoemaker who gave him many years earlier, 20 some years earlier, a pair of shoes free. And the rich people were very angry and very uh, insulted because they said, um, we are willing to pay all the expenses. You are the, 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 the great scholars. And they wanted to host him. So he, in public, reminds everyone 
more than 20 years ago when I was a young man, right? The shoemaker, the poor shoemaker, he made for me a pair of shoes free of charge. So what do you try to honor? You try to honor the horses in the wagon, my limousine you want to honor, right? The point here, what we said is, um, when you have the need, these people who volunteer to bring the wood to the temple, the leader of that generation and want to teach us as well, that when we give a recognition, we give those people at the time of crisis that they give their best and they should be recognized forever as well. So that's the message here, right? The Imahem, and together we learn at that time when they bring the 15 of Av, the wood, Kohanim, Velviyim. So it was together a priest, the Levites, and people that they are not so sure, which means you have individuals that said, I knew that my family gave one of those woods in the past, but I'm not sure what exactly date um, that occurred. So we incorporate them um, with, with those spe specific uh, occasions. Tanu Rabbanan mehayu bnei gonvei eliu bnei kotzei ktsiot. So I assume that all of you know the meaning of the word Ganev, right? Ganev is like a thief, right? So why they recognize the descendants of Gonvei Eli, the family that of, of uh, thieves, what do you mean by that? And why they recognize them? Especially the name sounds weird. So they said, Amru, the story is as follows. Once upon a time, it was the leader uh, and again, it's a question, it's a dispute. Who are these leaders? The Marsha hold that that story happened during the Second Temple, and it happened with the Assyrian Greeks, that they control Eretz Israel, but not total control, which means, excuse me, it was the early stage. They control the, we should call in the modern days, the, the travel road, the, the highways, those, those things. But they did not reach the stage of controlling the temple itself. So that's uh, one school of thought. And therefore, what happened with them, they tried to avoid days of celebrations. And what does that mean? Imagine you live in a northern Israel and you have a let's say a fig tree and the Torah tells us you remember in the book of Deuteronomy whenever you see the early stage of the figs you see the produce what do you have to do? you have to take a big basket put it in and travel, take your donkey and a wagon whatever and go and travel to the temple and bring the first of your fruit to the temple now it's a big big schlep, it's a big to do so you need to bring some something, some con, um, um, incentive, something to encourage those people to do it. So what did they do? The rules that all the people of Yerushalayim, of Jerusalem, they go out of their stores, they sing to them, they clap their hands, etc., etc. So they get a big honor and a big recognition when they reach Jerusalem. Okay? When the Assyrian Greek um, control those traveling roads, they try to stop that. No, I can't. Right? So they were standing on the roads and tried to avoid them from doing that. And since they control those directions, it was a serious challenge. That's one school of thought. Um, the Jerusalem Talmud, Yerushalmi, disputed that. He said, no. This applied to an era of the first temple during the time of year of Am, and soon you see several stories in regard to that era. But anyway, so we don't know what does that mean. Malchut at this point can be both ways. But what is their decree? Shelo yaviu bikurim li 
Bikurim, as we said, is the first fruit of the Shivat Aminim, of the seven species that the Torah tells us we need to take it and bring it to the temple. And therefore, um, um, they, they, they try to avoid it. So let's just make sure, I look at your faces, I want to make sure that you all understand the two school of thoughts. There's one school of thought that said that it happens during the second temple. And it was because the Assyrian Greek controlled the roads. And they tried to avoid that act of happiness because those people who did all of that, which is the, those who brought the first food to the temple, will be recognized. So you need to circumvent the system. You need to circumnavigate the way in order to reach the temple and have that celebration. That one school of thought. But there is another school of thought that speaks about the first temple. And what happened in the first temple? We know that the Torah asked everyone to go to Yerushalayim in the three festivals as a pilgrims. Pesach, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Three times a year, the pilgrims need to travel to visit the temple in Jerusalem. Unfortunately, as the Tanakh, as the uh, 24 books of the Bible describe in several places, right after the passing of King Solomon, the son of King David, the kingdom divided to two parts. It was the kingdom Malchut Beit David, the kingdom of came from the house of David, led by Rehovam, and it was Malchut Yisrael, another segment of kingdom that controlled by another person who turned to be very wicked and was named is Yerovam, Yerovam ben Nevat. Since it was a constant conflict between the two, you have two, two people that carry the, the, um, the title king, so, so therefore it was a friction. The rule is when it's come to the temple services, only the descendants of House of David can sit in the courtyard, while the descendants of others need to stand. And Yerovam did not wish, as the king of Israel, to partake of that while standing in the temple courtyard, which is indirect recognition of the other king. David the descendants, Rehavam, who is descendants of King David, okay? So therefore, because of that conflict, he, um, he sent an emissary, he sent an officers doing the first temple on the road to make sure that people will not ascend to Jerusalem, will not go and do the uh, partake of pilgrim services. Again, it was a it gets, you know, personal in that sense. Recognition, etc. So how people who are pious and God-fearing people wants to do the right thing, what do they do? How they fulfill the mitzvah of the first fruit? They brought a basket of the first fruit. They cover them with a dry figs, meaning that the officers will not recognize that this is the first food. And they carry on their shoulder that um, utensil. When they, they, they guards, the officers see them, the officer said, you guys, where are you going to? אומרים להם לעשות שני עיגולי דבלה במכתשת. So they, how do you say it in English? They exaggerated the truth, right? right. And they said, what? We're going to, to walk. We're not going to uh, as a pilgrim, right? We're going to smash those figs. שלפנינו ובעלי בעלי שעל כתפנו. כיוון שעברו מהם יתרום בשרים ובירו מירושלים. So גונבי אלי is גונבי דעת, meaning that they quote-unquote steal the mind, they don't steal cash, but they steal the mind of whom? Of those officers who are on the road. 
So therefore, we recognize their devotion by letting them bring in the wood uh, in the 15th of Av and recognize them publicly, okay? So there are two versions what exactly involve here. Tana, hen hen bnei salmai hanetofati. So Rashi explained to us that that's a very similar story which is not exactly the same. The question is, hen hen meaning the same or not? Tanu Rabbanan, ma'am bnei salmai hanetofati. אמרו פעם אחת גזרה מלכות גזרה על ישראל שלא יבואו יוצאים למערכה ושיבו פרו סדרות על הדרכים כדי שהושיבו לרבם מלבד הדרכים שלא יבואו ישראל לירושלים. As we explained לרגל, as we explained earlier. הביאו גזיריהן ועשו סלמות והניחו על כתפיהם והלכו להם כיוון שהגיעו אצלן אמרו להם לאן אתם הולכים? אמרו להם להביא גוזלות משובח לפנינו וסלמות של כתפינו. כיוון שעברו מהם פרקו מביאו אלוהים לירושלים ועליהם וכיוצא מהם הוא אומר זכר צדיק לברכה. So what happened here it's a little different version of that story. They, um, it was a decree, was um, uh, era of the first temple, and uh, they they commanded not to bring a wood for the temple. So what the people, how the people circumvent the system? They made it as a letter. They took the wood, they they made it um, in an art form of of letters. And when the guards on the way asked them what you're doing, they said we are we are, have a letters um, that um, that um, um, that needs in order to catch a birds. If the birds reach the nest and we want to pull out, we use that those letters. And then when they reach Yerushalayim, they dismantle those letters and use it for the wood in the altar. So we said. The memories of the righteous are for blessings. On the other bad king, Yerovam, that um, um, was bad, they mention him in a sense of a very negative way. And they, uh, Marsha said, that's the source of the idea of Yimach Shmo Vezichro in abbreviation. Anyway, the Esrimbo, at the 20 month, of Av, Bnei Fachat Moav Ben Yehuda. So they brought wood for the water. Tana, Bnei Fachat Moav Ben Yehuda, Hen Hen Bnei David Ben Yehuda, Divrei Rabbi Meir. These are the descendants of David, the King David, that it's from the tribe of Judah. And, and because he is a descendant um, from Ruth, the Moabite, so they call it that way. Uh, and it turned to be twice a year in the 20 of Tammuz and 20 of the month of Ab. That's the opinion of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yossi Omer, no, Henan Bnei Yoav Ben Tzuya. Yoav Ben Tzuya is also a descendant of Ruth because Tzuya, Tzuya is the mother of Yoav, was a sister of King David. That's Rashi said in Chronicle chapter 2. Then the Mishnah said, "Be'esrim be'elul bnei Adim ben Yehuda." That's the name of the family that recognized that, that day, twenty of Elul, they brought wood. Tanu Rabbi Nadne Adim ben Yehuda Hena bnei David ben Yehuda. So why it's called that way? So they, in the book of Samuel, they call King David Adino Ha'etzni. Adino is a, is a name of someone who is a very soft-spoken individual which uh, illustration of King David, when we sit, he sit and study, he was um, a very soft-spoken student, so very respectful to the sages. Ha'etzni, however, is a name of a warrior, tough warrior. So here they try to tell us that it's a, um, a combination of two opposites in his character. That's the way um, um, the Gemara in, in the tractate Moed Katan, page 16 tells us. Divrei Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Hen Hen, Yoav Ben Tzuya. So, if you think, just as a side note, I'm thinking how much family, those families are recognized since the time of the Talmud. Mm -hmm. You're talking now, what is it, 1700 years later, they still recognize those families. How much people can pay to have the perpetuation of recognition from one generation to the next. Anyway, Be'echad Be'tevet, Shavu Bnei Parosh, 
Shniya. So this family, Bnei Parosh, they brought wood second time. Mani Matniti, Lo Rab Meir, Lo Rab Yehuda, Lo Rab Yossi. You can't go by neither one of those opinions. I Rab Meir litnei Shavu Bnei David Ben Yehuda. Shniya. I Rab Yehuda litnei Shavu Bnei David Ben Yehuda. Shniya. I'm just read it first and then explain. I Rab Yossi litnei Shavu Bnei Yehuda Ben Tzuya. Shniya. So since in the Mishnah we only mention the family of Bnei Parosh, that they brought second time the wood for the temple, which means the Mishnah did not match neither one of these three views. So you have to say, Le'olam Rabbi Yossi, Utrei Tanai Aliba de Rabbi Yossi. There are two that follow his view, uh, meaning you have to think that it's from different families. Tosfot, at the very end, tells us, ונראה לי דלהלך אמור כאלה כרבי יוסי משום דרבי יוסי נמכו אמור מסתר בקבטי בכל מקום אפילו מחבריו. So anyway, Tosfot hold that it's from the Rabbi Yossi. Then the Mishnah said, באחד בטבת, באחד בטבת is the beginning of the new moon, the Rosh Chodesh, doing the Musaf, the additional prayer, we said the Halel. So, but because אחד בטבת is part of the eight days of the minor festival of Hanukkah, which is the rabbinic festival. So it was a full segment of the thanksgiving prayer, the Hallel, and it was part of the wood offering. Lo hayabu ma'amad. It was, they are so busy with all these prayer and rituals, so it was not a time of the group of the watchers. Amar leim ar-kashish abred rab chizda le rab ashi, 28b, what's the difference? Why we say that the Hallel that we recite at the end of the morning prayer, the Shacharit, is override the Ma'amad of that day versus Musaf, the additional prayer. And um, uh, in, because the way that we understand the Mishnah, only in the Mincha, in afternoon prayer, is no Ma'amad. So אמר לי רבא שיש לך לא דידי דחי דידי לא כל שכן. So אמר לי יהיה קמן לא ליתחיל את דידי. So so why מוסף why the additional prayer override the מאמד of מינחה? אמר לי יקר רבי יוסי דקאי קבותך דתניה רבי יוסי אומר כל יום שיש במוסף יש במאמד every day that they have the מוסף the additional prayer you have also מאמד. That's disputed of the תנאכמה. So that's basically רבי אקיבה before he changes mind מאמד דמי. What do you mean by saying Ma'amad? Ilay Ma'amad is Shacharit, if you tell me that's the morning. Hatana, Kama, Nameachi Kama. Ela, Ma'amad de Musaf. You have to say that that's applied to Musaf, the additional prayer. Didei Name lo Dachli. Ela, de Mincha. So you have to say that that's the Mincha. So it's still trying, Korban et Sim Dachli. Ela lav de Neila. Kol minei Dachli, de lav didei lo Dachli, shma mina. So it means that Rabbi Yossi himself hold the same as Mark Shisha, that the offering of Musaf not override only the Ma'amad itself, but not the one of Mincha and Ne'ilam. Velit and Name, since we learned in Mishnah that the first day of the month of Tibet, which is part of the Hanukkah, it wasn't any watch, it was only Ma'amad. So it means that other new moon they have. ולית נמי באחד מניסן לא היה בו ממן, מפני שיש בו הלל, וקורבן מוסף, וקורבן עצים. אמר רבא, זאת אומרת, הלילה, דברי שיער חלב דאורייתא. ואמר רבי יוחנן, משום רבי שמעון בן יהוד צדק, שמונה עשר יום בשנה, יחיד גומר בהם את ההלל. So here we have, a, as we said, a different concept of הלל. It's a big discussion how far you go with הלל. If um, the fool, the part, the saying, the, the blessing before the Hallel, etc. So, so far we understand that the only 18 days a year, even individual say the full, recite the full Hallel, which is the book of Psalms, Psalms 113 to 118. Now, the rest we skip. 11 verses from the, from the chapter 115, the book of Psalms, and chapter 116. Now, 
ואילו הן, here are the least, so that's what we call in our days full alel or chatsi alel, right? שמונת ימי החג, which is the seven days of the festival of Sukkot in Shmini Yatzer, ושמונת ימי חנוכה, the eight days of the festival of Hanukkah, ויום טוב הראשון של פסח, and the first day of the festival of Passover. So Tosfot here tells us an important point. He says, the Hanukkah dinah will be able to do the Hanukkah every day. Doing the Hanukkah every day, Tosfot said, the miracle increase. והיה כל אחד ואחד יום טוב, ולכן בסוכות כל יום ויום היה יום טוב לעצמו. דרפון סוכות, every day it's a separate יום טוב. לפי שפרי החג מתעתים והולכים, אבל פסח אינו משנה. During the סוכות you have less and less offering each and every day. וביום טוב של עצרת, which is the festival of שבועות, ובא גולה, and in diaspora that we have two days of festival of שבועות. So we complete הלל If you add that days in diaspora, in addition to the 18, we have 21 days, 21 days, ואלו הם תשעת ימי החג, ושמונת ימי חנוכה, ושני ימים ראשונים של פסח, ושני ימים טובים של עצרת. So meaning those days you recite the Hallel prayer, but the rest you do not say. So the whole idea of saying Hallel in Rosh Chodesh, we understand it's what? It's mean hag. It's a custom. Right? That's basically Tosfot in Erkin, page 10 tells us. So therefore, in the beginning of the month of Nisan, the Rosh Chodesh, the Hallel did not override the Ma'amad, only Rosh Chodesh Tevet, because of Hanukkah, override. Rav Ikla Levavel. So here we have a story of Rav. He lived in Eretz Israel, and it turns that he visited Babylon. חזינו דקקר ואללה בראש ירחה, he noticed that they say הלל אין ראש חודש, סבר להפסוקין הוא, he thought to uh, stop them, because in ארץ ישראל they did not recite הלל אין ראש חודש. כיוון דחזה דקמדל גידלוג, since he noticed that they skip some, as we said, they sum 115-116, אמר שמע מינה מנהג אבותם בידיהם. So you understand, I guess what? This is a minag that come from their ancestors. So he didn't bother with that. So Tosvot tells us, it's a big discussion about Ben Utam, etc. Um, what exactly you do? Do you make the bracha before the Hallel? Asher kidshanu b'mitzvota v'tzivanu likro et ha'alel? Yes or no? It's not so simple. Ta'ana, yachid lo yatchil v'mitchil gomer. So Tana Yachid, meaning individuals that not daven with non prayer with the others, he should not start the Hallel. If he start, he should complete. So I explained in my book on Rashi. Rashi said here, Yachid Klomar Afilu Yachid Gomer Bayanet Hallel. So in Brachot, page 14, have a discussion over that. So the whole idea is we, and Rashi here tried to imply that there's a big discussion of what's going on with the bracha before Alel, especially if it's individual. Who is Ashkenazim? Follow the Rema, and we do say Halel. Sephardim, Eastern Jews, follow the Maran, and part of the Hasidim as well, and they do not recite on Rosh Chodesh, a bracha before Hallel. There is a um, um, minag of Tzfat, people who live in northern Israel, they try to follow the Maran in that sense, and as I said, Sephardim, some of the Hasidim, and some of people of Tzfat, they do not recite the bracha before the Hallel on Rosh Chodesh. Now, as far as the individual in con is concerned, a person needs to ask his Rav, that question, it's not so simple when individual recited without a minyan. Some said you need another two to do it, but it's not so simple uh, when individual recite Hallel to do it with bracha or without the bracha. The Mishnah said, now you see how beautiful and appropriate and applicable is this text. This upcoming Tuesday, it's the first day of 17 of Tammuz, and they tell us in the Mishnah 
that five said events occurred on those days, on, the, on that day, on 17 of Tammuz. Number one, Nishtabru Aluchot. Moses broke the tablets according to our tradition. Menalan, the Tanya. We learn uh, when we calculated the days that Moses was in the Mount Sinai. So they, they, um, the Gemara in Shabbat, if you remember, on page 86 of the discussion, what exactly how? But it's clear that Moses was there on the seventh. Monday, Amar Beshishanitnu, Beshishanitnu, or Beshiva la Moshe. So Rashi tells us here. Beshiva la Moshe le Kabel Luchot Klomar, Vadai le Kaman de Paligala. So since we said um, that. Um, we calculate in, in the, that way, so it's clear, and based on what we said in Ma'ayin Yoma, that it's, um, that it's Beshiva Nitnu Beshiva La Moshe. So the seven of Sivan. Dichti Vayikrael Moshe Bayom Ashbi Yuchti Vayavu Moshe Betoch Anad Vayal Al Arba Yom Moshe Bar Yom Bar Yom Laila. So here is the way that we calculate it. 24 de Sivan Vetshitzar de Tammuz. When we speak about 24 day of month of Sivan, so from the 7th, the time that Moses went up, until the, until the 30, because Sivan is the full month, 30 days, and 16 day of the month of Tammuz, Malu Lehon Arba'in. So all together, it's a 40 days. Beshiv Sar Betamuz, Nachit Ata. So this uh, 17 day of the month of Tammuz, Moses descend from the mountain, and he came to the camp of Israel, and he broke the tablet. Uchtiv, they said in the book of Shmot, in Exodus chapter 32, when Moses came close to the camp, and he saw the camp, and he smashed the tablet and broke them under the mountain. So you see, that's the first event related to this upcoming Tuesday, the first day of 17 of Tammuz. The crisis of broke the biblical story of Moses broke the tablets. Second crisis is Batel HaTamid. The daily offering as in a temple was uh, abrogated, was annulled on that day, 17 of Tammuz. Gemara, so uh, Rabbeinu Hanel have a different version of what exactly happened. It's a big question when that happened, the first or the second temple. Uvkeir, the city wall breach, the city of Jerusalem. Beshiva Sarava, so is that happened on 17 of Tammuz? We have a quote in Jeremiah chapter 52. Bachodesh Sharavi'i, on the fourth month, which is the month of Tammuz, but Ishala Chodesh Vechezaka Rabbi, it was a tremendous famine in the city of Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and you see that the city was breached at the 9 of Tammuz, not on the 17 of Tammuz. So the Gemara said, Amarab alokash ekan barishona kam bashniya. We have to differentiate between the destruction of the first versus the second temple. The, the verse in Jeremiah speaks about the first temple, when the city was breached on the 9th of the month. And the Mishnah speaks here about the second temple, and that happened on 17 of Tammuz. So it's a, um, according to the Babylonian Talmud, so 17 of Tammuz is only second temple. Jerusalem Talmud have a different version. But the Tanya Barishona, the first temple, of Ir Betisha Betamuz, the city of breached on the 9th of Tammuz, Bashniya, during the destruction of the second temple, Beshiv Asar Bo. So the sages basically did not want to impose upon people and have two fast days. So therefore, they put it only in the 17th of Tammuz. And since we are in a state that the second, the third temple is not rebuilt yet, so we still followed only the time of the second temple. That's the way the two on the code and Tafkuf Mem Tet said. The Tashbets. Um, ask here a question. It's uh, one of the um, um, later um, rabbis. He asked, the, "How about the first of ten of Tevet? Uh, why are we observing it if it's applied to the first temple, etc." Anyway, the fourth crisis was Saraf Apostemos et Torah. 
apostomos burn the Torah. How do we know it? Gemara, that's the way we receive the tradition from our ancestors. Ha'emid Tselem Baichal, the king of the the wicked king, brought an idol, Tselem, in the sanctuary, Menalad. The Khtiv, they said in the book of Daniel, chapter 12, Ume'et, who sar atamid, velatet shikutz shomem. From that day they stopped the Anal, the daily offering, 17 of Tammuz, he brought this Tselem, this idol. Vechadava. So the question is, it's only one? And Rashi tells us, the aktiv al knaf shikutzim, klomar aktiv krach, arena dechtiv be shikutzim de mash matrei. So, so, knaf is individual. And the marasha elaborate on this Rashi, uh, because here you use the word shikutzim, meaning that it's more than one. It's not just one tselem, amarava trei havu. He said that it was two separate one that King ben the wicked king, uh, uh, um, uh, brought. However, when a fal chad al chavrei v'tavrei l'eledi dey, one was fell on, on the other and broke the others. So therefore, we use the word shikutz as individual. V'ishtakach de ha'avakti, and it was found on that tselem, on that idol that was written, page 29, and tzavit l'acharu ve'beita, Yadach Ashlimat Lei. So Rashi said, Klomar Ve'ala Be'yadi. So here there is a uh, Marsha and, and, uh, and more. Um, in simple way is that hand you intend to destroy my temple, meaning in a way God said it, and I like take vantage, I pay you back, and I pay by cut off your hand. Boyachem le shuloim, alachai, a shuloim, alachai.